everybody. Welcome to the Fortress Comic News, episode 106, the new and improved Fortress Comic News. Yes, I have a new mic and a new camera. Wow. And special. I am one of your hosts, Chris, alongside the new and improved Mike. No, I'm just the old mic. You have the new mic. He's talking with the new mic, and I'm the old mic. Welcome, everyone, to the show. Uh, we do have a fantastic interview today with Mr. Brian Wood, um, writer for Dark Horse, a lot of creator-owned properties, um, Marvel. Uh, he's done Star Wars. He's doing Aliens. He's writing a novel, and we, you'll hear all about it. Um, so, yeah, stay right tuned right. for that. Writer, one of my favorite creator on books, Rebels, too. So I've read Rebels, yep. Rebels out. And uh, currently, the um, um, for the book behind me, Sword Daughter. But you can't see the title, but yeah, it's like a <laughs> Japanese cinema style book, Samurais. You know, you know how I love that stuff. So I think I'll, uh, I'm going to, um, it's actually in my shopping cart as we speak. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, we got a little bit of, uh, TV news of the new Doom Patrol trailer that's coming. That's coming this Friday, which is uh, it's pretty soon. So I already have my DC TV app ready to go. I don't know if Chris Chris got to subscribe or resubscribe. Yeah, I got to resubscribe. Probably do it when we're done recording today. But uh, yeah, I'm super excited for this. The trailer looks really cool. Uh, I like how it's not super dark and gritty, and actually mm-hmm. it's kind of fun and interesting. And uh, Brendan Fraser has a few good lines in there. Yeah, he's gonna, he's definitely gonna be the star. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. I, I do need to re up and finish off Titans. I mean, I watched that first episode and enjoy it, but just fell off because of everything going on. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. But, same. Uh, but this one has uh, my attention a lot more than Titans ever did. So I, I look yeah. forward to seeing what they got going on. The uh, I was a little worried about the cyborg and how he's gonna. Um, yeah, look on the screen, but he looks he looks pretty good. I I think the from what we've seen, it looks pretty pretty okay to me. Um, I actually, man, having an Amazon Fire Stick just makes everything so convenient because they stopped selling. I didn't realize this CW TV app works on your Fire Stick, so I've been I'm completely caught up on Flash um, <clears throat> as of this week. Are you caught up? No, I actually haven't even watched any of the shows that come back uh whether oh, okay. walking dead or flash so well flash has been amazing um the it's they're doing for a little bit they're like villain of the week style but the uh they're getting close uh, they're kind of teetering on the edge of um if they're uh barry's daughter is gonna have her secret revealed that she's working with um eobard thon mm-hmm. in the future and I don't know, like, what her end game is yet. Like, we don't know what the what's going to happen. And this whole thing with Cicada too is kind of uh, uh, they're still working that out. And it's it was a really dumb episode where where um, Cicada they find out where Cicada lives, and uh, you know, Barry. Uh, nobody. I think Iris is the only person that knows, and she goes there to like pose as someone and ask questions, and obviously, like. He's gonna know she's up to no good. Like he lives in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and so she like tries to break into the home, and it's like, but you know the Flash. Like, why wouldn't you just tell the Flash where he lives? Yeah. Like, why are you trying to like go Mission Impossible? Which kind of made me mad. Like, you're a reporter. Why are you breaking into people's houses? Um, but that yeah, sounds like one of those we have a 22 episode order to fill. So yeah, it <laughs> seems like a couple of filler episodes in between there. Um, but still, you know, it's still good. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm excited for Doom Patrol this Friday, and I am. I I watched the first episode of Young Justice season three, which is really good. Um, the first episode kind of you get a uh, a new roster, and we get to see where everybody is in the future. Like, um, Aqua Aqua Lad is now Aquaman, and all this stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, seeing people part of the Justice League, and and also uh, the um. There's uh, interactions between the Justice League and the Titans and everyone, which is pretty cool to see too. Um, they basically have to they reboot the whole squad for Young Justice, and uh, you kind of see why, but I won't give anything away. And then Titans, Titans is really good. I'm almost finishing up the the first season, but they keep hinting at her father, uh, Raven's father. We all know is Trigon, so yeah. Um, He's he's definitely showing up. The big bad is going to show up at the end of the season for sure. 
yeah, these next couple of weeks are going to be TV f- heavy for me trying to catch up on things. Yeah. And we keep, they keep hinting at of like, uh, Dick Grace and Robin being his own person and how, um, there, he actually runs into Jason Todd, who's the new Robin. And they have this, like, they spend this whole episode together of like, Oh, he lets you drive the Batmobile. And he's like, yeah, didn't he let you and all this stuff. And that was pretty cool to see and how they're completely two different types of Robins. Um, they almost do Jason Todd, like Damian Wayne style, where he's the young punk, like would rather kill people than actually, you know, arrest anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was pretty cool to see. So I think like, I think Dick Grayson kind of realizes himself that, okay, maybe I need to distance myself away from Batman and all this other stuff. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the season, we see him in his, in his Nightwing costume. Um, yeah, so we got some Super Bowl teasers. Yay. Did you like the Avengers one that showed absolutely nothing but got everybody super hyped? I liked it in as much as I got to see more Avengers stuff. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was about it. The The one that really actually stood out to me was one that I prior to the Super Bowl had zero interest in, and that's Hobbs and Shaw. Oh, I can't wait. Um, so I'm not a Fast and Furious guy. Um, this should be a Fast and Furious podcast. Yeah, and- Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie so much. But th- this movie just looks like a really great action movie with like a superhero twist to it. Yeah. And it just, I love the back and forth between The Rock and um, who's the other actor? Oh, Jason Statham. Jason Statham. And they actually, I don't think they get along in real life, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, like their their back and forth and how their characters interact was really cool. I I thought they had a good chemistry there, so I, I think they got something really cool on their hands and could be a interesting sub fast and nefarious movie moving forward if they do continue with it. Yeah, um, I like the fact that Fast and the Furious is kind of embracing the meme of okay, we have superheroes in this universe now. Yeah, it's so I. I think I fell off of... I watched like the first two back when they first came out. And those... I'm sorry to any fans of those, but those movies are awful. And uh, then uh, my girlfriend, my recent girlfriend, got me into back into them. And I saw five... Whatever the last two were. It's eight and seven. Okay. Wow. Eight. <laughs> Which is... They're not They're not about cars anymore. The movies no. are not about cars. And they're just... Yeah, if you turn your brain off, they're just like decent action movies with a... Decent action. With a, a background of... of um, about family. So I, I did Amelia. enjoy them. I'm just not a huge fan of them. I don't like look forward to them like a lot of people do. But this one, like I am down for in the theater seeing this. It looks great. Yeah. Um, plus the rock is just so enjoyable to watch on big screen, man. Oh, like, yeah. I don't know what he's just very captivating. Like he doesn't, there isn't much difference in him from role to role. I mean, I'm not saying that he's a bad actor, but he's just like, he's one of those actors for me. That's like, when he's on the screen, you're just going to enjoy what he's doing. Yeah. So, um, he just, it just, it just works like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited for, uh, for that movie. Um, and also really excited for the Avengers, but yeah. So we also, you know, we got the, um, the news about, uh, Ben Affleck not being Batman anymore. Um, do we have, do we have a, do we have a Batman casting that we would like? Do you have one in mind? I don't, Uh, I'm a little, I'm a little upset because you know how, like, if anybody doesn't know, like the famous artist, um, he does a lot of the mashups of like when when there's an article or someone uh, someone comes out and says they want to play a character, he'll do like a he'll do like a mashup on, of them, like a, a Photoshop edit picture of them on his Instagram. Uh, yeah. Boss, Boss Logic, his name is. Yes. And so he was promoting some images when he heard this news the other day of the guy who plays Russo on uh, in the first. Or the the two seasons of Punisher, he's the villain. Um, he becomes the villain, uh-huh. and that's the actor he thinks. And he's also the he's also like the uh, antagonist in um, Westworld as well. But I really don't think he. I don't. He's got like that actor to me because he's been like such shitty characters um, that I just want to like punch him in the face. He's got like one of those punchable faces. My friend said, and I'm like, that's an accurate description because I just. 
when he's on screen, like he's got, you just don't, you want to hate him. And now, like if he became Batman, I'm just like, I don't know if I could, yeah. I could deal with that. There, there was the rumor of uh, the guy who starred in Twilight being Bruce Wayne, Tom Patterson. Yeah, that was the one. No, and I'm not for that either. I that's oh, just, God. that's awful casting. I'm definitely going to Mars if that happens. Like, sign me up. I'll be the. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be on this earth anymore. It's it's tough because I mean Affleck to me was so perfect. Like Affleck. I'm, he did it again. Damn it. Yeah. Affleck is so perfect. Like he's he's got the I know people give him so much shit, but I'm gonna defend him to the end of the right. day. This is becoming a Ben Affleck podcast, by the way, because we talked about yeah. a lot of podcasts, but I'll I'll talk about Ben Affleck all day if you want. We could we keep going. Yeah, but he's he's got the look. Like Batman needs to be tall. He's tall, broad shoulders, and like square headed. <laughs> <laughs> He needs to have that like that that tough jaw and that almost like look to him. Yeah, and <laughs> that, the, uh, uh, the brooding, the brooding. Look. Yeah, you know, what, you know uh, Chris like, is doing like a Frankenstein impression right now. <laughs> But he, he needs that, and all these actors they keep throwing out there are like, who's the prettiest boy of them all? And <laughs> yeah, I I don't see any of them. the The only one that keeps coming in it's. It's probably just because I listen to way too much Kevin Smith, but John Hamm would be cool. Yeah, John Hamm is kind of older. Yeah. I am, I just thought of this the other day. Uh, do you remember how? Um, do you remember how the Dark Knight trilogy ends with yes. Joseph Gordon-Levitt finding the Robin costume? Just like skip ahead, make Joseph Gordon-Levitt Batman. It's not bad either, right? Yeah, I think I'm onto something here. I I think you you gotta. I, every time we talk about a DC movie, I bring up Marvel, but you gotta like yeah. Marvel it, and you gotta you gotta. Well, find, think about you gotta, this: you gotta Captain find someone I don't know and make him. Captain America's contract is up, isn't it? Yeah, just saying. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Which Chris is that? Chris uh, Evans. Chris Evans. Yeah. <laughs> not Hemsworth and not uh, Pratt. I always get it mixed up. So now the internet don't fail me. There needs to be a Photoshop of Chris Evans from Not Another Team Movie with the bat cowl on and yeah. uh, the whipped cream over his junk. <laughs> that needs to happen now. He's already donned it once, and that's that's the most budget costume you could probably get out of all the Batman. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we pretty much beat like, that topic down. But I I don't know. I'm do you know? Here. You know, it was a fantastic rumor that was going around though. What? Like, apparently, Penguin's going to be the villain in uh-huh. the Batman. Uh-huh. Um, Jack Black is the Penguin. Oh my god. I'm sorry, dude. I think that's fantastic. Even if it's a serious Jack Black, like, that's just, dude, I think it would be perfect, because if you look at Jack Black in his career now, and you look at Danny DeVito and his career where he was, like, this, this was like the, the serious role for for Danny, and, oh, man. Yeah, that rumor's been running around, and I was, I read that earlier today, and was like, that is so perfect, please. I, oh, I never even would have thought, but, like, to put him in a serious role like that, dude, wow. And and Jack Black's one of those guys, like, I'm not a huge fan of him, but I just watched uh, Jumanji. Yeah. And he's just so good in it. And it right. reminded me of like old Jack Black when I really enjoyed his work. Mm-hmm. And to see that he still has that. And man, like it, it he would just kill it as Penguin. Please. He really would. Penguin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's cut to our amazing interview with Brian Wood. And we will see everybody on the other side. Hey, guys. Chris here interrupting the show real quick. Remember, if you want to show your support for Force Comic News, head on down to patreon.com slash Force Comic News, where just a dollar a month gets you uh, access to our Slack channel, where we can talk comics all day and all night, and an uh, exclusive Patreon podcast that we're uh, uploading very soon, a uh, series of games that we play with all the great guests we have here on Force Comic News. You're going to get one of those every month. And just just a dollar a month gets it for you. So remember, that's the best way to show your support there and to help a growing community and to be a part of it with us. 
So everybody, thanks for your support, and on with the show. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the show, uh, writer extraordinaire, Brian Wood. Hey, Brian. hey there. Welcome thanks for having show, me man. on. Oh, no, um, thank you. Thanks for having me. So what we what we like to do, we like to start off, uh, how, how did you get in the comic book industry, and uh, what got you started? Was it yeah. like comics, or... Well, no, oh, okay. <laughs> that's where my, uh, I'm, I've told this story a couple of times. I'm going to try to tell it in a different way with different info. Oh, okay. So I don't, you know, for if someone's heard it before, but basically I am different from almost all my other peers mm-hmm. in that I didn't read comics much, much as a kid. You know, I don't have that story where I fell in love with fantastic four or something, you know, yeah uh reading it in the dentist office or whatever (laughs) you know i i like i mean i knew what comics were you know but it wasn't something that i read and i grew up in a really rural place and i'm sure i could have found comics if i really tried but it wasn't like they were everywhere you know Mm -hmm. so um and it wasn't until i was in in art school that i discovered vertigo comics and I came about to them because I was following Dave, Dave McKean, who, and Ken Williams, those, those kinds of guys who I knew mm-hmm. from their non, non-comics work, right? Yep. Yep. So I came at it from a very sort of snooty art student <laughs> kind of way, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm like, I'd go to the comic store and I'm like, I like this Vertigo comic. But the, I have no use for all these superheroes, you know. Is it that, <laughs> Ooh, that who's kind Batman? Of, why, do, why do you even read Batman? It's all the same tape stuff. I could appreciate Batman in, as the movies, but like you know, as far as the comics goes, I was like very, very high and high and mighty about it at the time. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I gradually sort of, you know, expanded outward. I think I went from just like looking at the covers of (laughs) vertigo comics to like reading a lot of indie stuff, like, like hate by Peter, Peter bag, you know, which was very much like the life I was living at the time. (laughs) You know, it was like pretty, pretty into it. I could see me, see myself in it. And, you know, so then it just sort of like grew from there. I appreciated a wider range. I went back and read all the classics. Uh, Everybody should have read by that point. Um, and was really thinking about maybe the, this is something I can do for for a job. You know, I was in art school as a as a painter, um, so I just kind of began to make comics on my own, like looking at a lot of comics, like copying, like going through my Frank Miller phase, going through like yeah, yeah. Ro, Romita phase. Like I was like trying yeah. out all the stuff, trying to f- to figure out what I what I was, you know, okay. and. Um, started to make you know i hooked up with some other friends in art school that you know were kind of like thinking along the same lines as me like experimenting with comics and we self-published a couple of books basically just to practice we're like i mean i'm lettering the comics i'm writing them i'm drawing them we're just like we're putting together a book we're getting it printed um and uh one of those a 14 page story which was like my first crack at at my book Ch- channel zero was actually done as my senior thesis oh wow grad awesome. graduating college mm-hmm. and that summer i went to san diego comic-con oh, and cool. handed out a copy of it, a physical copy to every any publisher that i could find <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I cast a wide net, like yeah. people that know, know, you know, from like the Marvels and the DCs to like, like Billy Tucci's company, like all these like random places. I just gave it to anybody who would take it, you know. So this is like late '90s Comic Con. This was '90. This would have been '96. Okay. So um, there's a lot of a lot of stuff circulating around, right? There is, and yeah. I know nothing. I mean, yeah, like I said, yeah. I'm not a comic book guy. Like this mm-hmm. is my first time going there. It's like I. Like, I mean, I think I could tell you the difference between Marvel and DC by looking at the pictures in their booth. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, I had no idea. Like, I'm yeah. like, they're all the same to me, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and the only person, I got two calls. One was from Vert- Vertigo. 
And one was from Jim Va Valentino at Image. And I don't know if you remember, but that was back when he had his little black and white line of comics. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Back then. That's where Bendis got his, got his start, too, with the Jinx. Um, mm. So I lived in, in New York, so I went over to Vertigo. And they were, it was like a weird like bait and switch where they were like, yeah, we, we read your comic. We don't want that. <laughs> you know, why don't oh. you do uh, samples for us as like a possible fill in artist? Oh, like, wow. I just graduated college. So I was like, yes, right? I love Virgo. Yeah. So, and that was back when the industry was healthy enough where they paid me money to do samples. Like, they paid everybody money to do right, samples. Right, right. Yeah. So, I did samples of The Invisibles oh, cool. and House of Se Secrets. Oh, nice. Uh, and got hired for for neither of those. <laughs> um, but in the but that was what I like. I met Axel Alonso. I met Shelley Bond. It was good. It was like worth it, you know. And yeah. obviously, I got got paid. You got the um, but also, yeah, and also Jim Valentino called me up, and he's like, "I actually want this channel, Channel Zero thing. Can you can you make a, a comic?" That's and so I'm cool. like, "I guess so." Again, I have no idea. I don't understand previews catalog. Or the mm. direct market, like I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, um, so I did five five issues of of, of that, um, driving Jim insane because I'm like late. I'm like have no like concept of like previous time or solicitation. Mm. Like whatever. I'm just like trying to make a comic, and I don't understand all the all the logistics of it. I'm yeah. like changing the page count every every issue you know <laughs> um so uh that was kind of where i where i started and that was like my first real comic like in the comic book bookstores um and obviously it didn't do great it's not like it was i was gonna make it make a living off of you know a black and white comic at image at the time that was selling like four thousand copies um which was very which was normal <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, and this was like during the dot-com boom when i was in new york and i started to get all these jobs doing doing that so comics kind of got got put on pause while i made like ad banners <laughs> for like a hundred grand a year in the dot com boom. <laughs> this is like really insane back then. Um, yeah, everyone needed them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Everyone needed them. Too much, too much money uh, floating around. And then I, but but I still wanted to do comics. Like it had gotten under my skin, you know. Even even if I wasn't going to do it for like money, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm going to do it for uh, fun. And um, so I mean, I don't know how how much you of this you want me to keep on going, but that was basically where I began, and then I started to like experiment um, nice. in like indie comics and making my own comics with uh, friends and stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like I mean, oh. so the only thing I will add to that is because I didn't grow up with comics, mm -hmm. that kind of like set the that kind of put me on a certain career path. Where yeah. even though to to this day I have done books like I've done X Men books, right and stuff I don't I'm not a natural fit for mm -hmm. that like I have to do a lot of research, you know so that's why so my career sort of took a more of a creator owned in, independent route you know and the and the company books I do are based off of movies like Aliens and Star Wars yes yeah, right. Which I'm on the superhero stuff so that was gonna be my next question even though you weren't a big comic book fan were you a still kind of a nerd in terms of the movies were you a big star wars aliens guy or i think everybody is a star wars guy or girl <laughs> um, yeah i was a, uh, I was an aliens person for sure i mean mm -hmm. that was pretty cool um so like you know that kind of like pop culture or genre stuff i was definitely into um and that's like i said that's kind of been the been the company jobs i've i've gravitated towards the uh the creator owned stuff i mean you I, I think you have out of all our guests probably the most when you said that i mean you have so many volumes of of projects here yeah. um and we'll probably be here for hours if we want to talk about every one of them but the uh the ones that, that i wanted to talk about or at least get our our are like viewers, you know, they, they need to know about some of these books. Um, was North Northlanders 
Yeah, uh, how was that? Anders. Yeah, can you give us like that plot description? Yeah, that's my um <laughs> that's a book that should should not have done as well as it as it did. Um, yeah, exactly. I remember it being really popular. My, I really pitched it at like I described it to my ed- as a, an editor as a Viking crime series. Okay. <laughs> um and you know, that was that was after he had sort of challenged me to pitch an, a second monthly book at Vertigo because I was doing DMZ at the time. Mm-hmm. And he's like, but I don't want any of your like New York City hipster <laughs> garbage. Like I want you to pitch something something out of the blue, like something yeah. out of out of your comfort zone is what he yeah. thinks. And honestly, I don't know why I landed on that. I think I was just sit- sitting in my office looking at books on my shelf. Uh-huh. And being like, what do I like? You know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, what can I think of? What what's in what interests me that that is out of my comfort zone? Yeah. And there's some Viking book on there. So I was like, I feel like I can approach this in a way that at the time did did not not exist in comics, which was mm-hmm. to do Vikings, but to leave all the mythology to the side. Mm-hmm. You know, no fur fur bikinis. <laughs> Nobody talks in in old English. You know, right. <laughs> basically no, basically no Thor, no Dungeons and Dragons, and no yeah, mythology. No. You know, yeah, just like straight, like street level, gritty Viking stuff um, with like a sort of like a crime angle, which is like a little vague. I was trying to like sell it, sell it to my editor with that line, mm-hmm. but basically, I wanted a, like a lot of freedom and to do it in like an anthology format with different artists. And we did 50 issues of that, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That it did that well, um, which I, I give myself and the artist part of the credit, but it was also like a really good, good time in comics then. So something like, like that had a, had a shot. Yeah. It's definitely my first time hearing about a, a Viking crime noir book <laughs> <laughs> but it, it when but then now there's that tv show and now you see other things and it's right. like a thing that yeah. is a thing now you know it's yeah. like um yeah. where it's not conan you know your vikings are not mm. conan or thor there's something else you know mm. exactly <sighs> yeah so then speaking of conan what is your connection with conan i know you've done a ton of the uh, books while he was at dark horse did you have a, a prior <laughs> connection to him uh, only just having read read a couple of the novels um and seeing the movies um that was that was a weird time when i was getting that was when the regime flip flipped over at dc Mm -hmm. and i was finding myself getting my vertigo books canceled and not a lot of options at dc Mm -hmm. (laughs) like i was not one of like i was a paul levitt's karen burger guy I am not a Dan Dan DiDio and Jim Lee guy, you know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's just the way the way the way it is, you know. They yep. just have their own favorites, you know. Mm-hmm. So I was reaching out for like, where can I where can I go? Where can I pay my rent? You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I was talking to Dark Horse and to their and I was a little bit desperate at this time to, to be honest. <laughs> and to their credit, they basically said we we got your back we'll give you two monthly books worth of work wow we're not sure what they are right now you can just go to go to sleep tonight like with the comfort of knowing that you're that you're you're employed here you know that's awesome which is really nice and yeah. so we t- so in the next week or two we uh, we t- we talked and one of them was my creator on book t- book the uh, massive Mm-hmm. And yep. the other one was the 25 issue run on Conan, and it wasn't like I was in a position to be to be picky. Like I was very grateful to to them, but mm-hmm. honestly, like they they presented Conan to me in an interesting way. They were like, our license holder is kind of tired of the super macho, super grim, super over muscled. Conan, they want this series to be set earlier in Conan's life when in the books he's described as being like leaner, panther like. I don't know. They have there's all these descriptions and also very unsure of himself. He's like 20 at this time in his in his in his life, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of cool. That was something I felt like was I could approach in like a fresher kind of way and not feel like I was just like trying to mimic 
like the 1970s Savage Sword, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and that's, that got you the start or your foot in the door there to do the massive. Cause that was a pretty popular comic with them too. We, I think I started the massive first, but I was, oh, okay. both those. I was the, both those, those jobs were given to me at the exact same that time. So. Okay. And the massive was your idea, right? Yes. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's hear the quick cliff notes of what that, that was. That is, um, I was really into, uh, the the whale wars tv show oh, wow yeah <laughs> i'll be I'll, I'll be i'll be honest with you i was like watching that and you know i mean in my creator on books i've i had had established by that point a certain pattern mm-hmm. of if i'm not doing like slice of life stuff like demo mm-hmm. i'm doing political comics like dmz you know okay yeah or channel, yep. or channel zero so i'm like what's my next big like multi-year socio-political book gonna mm-hmm. gonna be be uh, be about and basically i just sat down and thought like what do i give give a shit about <laughs> and i'm like well i'm like give a shit about the environment you know yeah so i sort of like took that tv show that i was a fan of mm-hmm. and all my personal beliefs about you know you know the uh, planet and climate change and mm-hmm. with a hefty dose of like creation mytho- mythology and yep. came up with this um sort of end of the world scenario where a couple of boatloads of of environmentalists realize they've they've sort of failed like the the climate is crashing the world is ending despite all their efforts right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and here they are adrift in the in the ocean I'm um, trying to figure out what 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 to do. What's the next step? What's the next stage in in uh, humanity? You know, awesome. How how bad is it going to get? How do they survive? And the the idea is that like, is there a is there a second chance for us? Mm-hmm. And if there is, can we can we make better choices next time? And That's not cool. just fuck it, fuck it all up all, all over. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, so it began as like you know you read the first few and it's like this is like a straight up like like action comic on boats and there's pirates and there's mm-hmm. like hel- hel- helicopters and mega storms and everything. And yeah. by the end, it was like this real sort of rich creation mythology with like immortal beings and blah blah blah. Yeah. Wow. That's so awesome. uh, and that went for 50 yeah. Issues. Right. That went for thirty issues, and 30? then oh, okay. six issue prequel, awesome comic of that. So thirty six total. Really cool. Yep. So then that gets you to, if I'm my timeline's correct, around where uh, they give you Star Wars, correct? Yeah, that was during that that time. Conan had ended. Um, and so out of the blue, they were like, are you, are you interested in Star Wars? And I'm like, <laughs> sure. Yeah. But, you know, like that was, that was a while ago. There was, there was no, no Disney in the mix there. Right. You know, right. it was like yeah. a much quieter, quieter time for Star Wars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly, I would not having done Star Wars then and seeing even what level of, of licensor interference or involvement there was i would not want to be doing doing it now <laughs> i can only imagine yeah. how, much worse, how yeah. much worse it's gotten you know yep so i mean i was happy to have done it then when i did 20 issues of that and uh i could do it relatively with a lot of freedom with a lot of creative freedom oh, um that's great and it was that was a lot of fun so so this Definitely is around the fun- this is around the time that I become a Brian Wood fan because that book I really enjoyed. But then right after that, um, we get Rebels, which is my favorite book of yours personally. So where did Rebels come from? That was so, all right. Not to delve too deep into my psyche, but (laughs) (laughs) so Northlanders, while Northlanders ran 50 issues, it was canceled. And I was pretty upset about that. (laughs) Like I had put a lot of, I had invested a lot of my emotional self into that title Mm -hmm. and I loved it. And I wish I could every day. I think I think about it. So I was, I basically wanted to see if I could recreate not Northlander specifically, but a book like it, 
a book that was a, a historical thing, approach it from the same ground level way, uh, rotating artists, basically see if I can, you know, catch lightning twice. Mm -hmm. um which is not the way to like approach it <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you you know like you should never be like comparing your, yourself to other things like that yeah. you know yeah, yeah. um but i legitimately had an interest and a connection to that history um and i thought it came out great i had a lot of fun fun with that book you know and we may still be doing a third volume of it at some some point um we did two um and uh it was it i always feel like i have to explain to people that uh that started before hamilton did and i'm grateful for that <laughs> because <laughs> i felt like you know hamilton like really redefined how everybody considers that history right. and i don't know if i even would have bothered to be honest with you mm. if if it was after hamilton i'd be like there's nothing I can do that's going to be as fresh or as interesting mm -hmm. as that. I feel like I'd be like launching it in the shadow of this like be behemoth, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I remember I went to a, to a comics pro meeting and which is where we, we announced rebels and I had my little speech cause I was going to get up in front of all the retailers and like pitch the book to, to them. Mm -hmm. And I was writing down, I was trying to explain to them why this his history has more cultural rele relevance than you might think if you didn't really think about it. And I was listing, I was like, there's like Assassin's Creed video game. Yep. There was a TV show on, on AMC at the time called The Turn, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like listing things, you know, and like a lot of political books, you know, like try to, you know, deal with this. And, um, on that morning, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and my wife is, is here, and she texts me a New York Times art article that is about, there's this new hip-hop Hamilton play, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's dumb, right? <laughs> like, I'm not even going to bother mentioning that in my little speech. Like, yeah. what, what is that? I don't even know what, the, what this is. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, uh, so, yeah, and... You know who's 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 laughing now? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took off a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's let's get to what you're you're writing today. Uh, what are the what's the stuff you're putting out today? Well, the thing I'm doing is um, it's tricky to know what I can talk about, but I'm in the middle yeah. of, a, of an aliens book. Right. Um, you brought that back. Uh, you started with the Defiance. Now you're on to the Resistance, right? Right. So in Defiance, I'll just back up a second. So mm -hmm. Defiance, Tristan Jones and I created that character, Zula Hendricks. Right? And she's awesome. I think it's really Fox? just a, a, yeah. a, a side note. It's I, it's probably um, it's hard to, you know, go toe to toe with Ripley or put a, a really strong character up against like comparing her right with the original yeah. Alien movies. But I, I think she's pretty strong herself. So it's a pretty cool character. Thank you. Yeah. Fox loves her. Yeah. As far as Fox is concerned, she's like like official, right? Yeah. She's le legit. Yeah. Um, and again, that's like a little bit bitter, bittersweet because mm -hmm. I'm like, I just gave it away, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's a work yeah. for for higher book, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, obviously, I'm very honored. Um, so they came back to me, and well, it's a dark horse. Mm -hmm. and they're like, we want more Zula. Also, we're thinking of putting Amanda Ripley into a comic, awesome. the daughter of uh, Ellen. Yeah. And um, would would Brian want to give it another shot? And of course, Brian Brian would. Mm -hmm. um, so I I signed up again, and so what I'm writing now is Aliens Resistance, which mm -hmm. is a four issue comic. And I will tell you without giving too much away, there's a lot more coming. Right. Yeah. Yep. So. Well, that should be like announced very, 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 very soon. Awesome. But um, I don't, I don't, they structured it in four issue pieces and four issue chunks for reasons that are not mine, are not mm -hmm. are beyond me, that are above my pay grade. Yeah. Yep. But there's a lot more more coming. I've been writing Aliens for like a year now, so That's there's great. a lot coming. And um, there's also a uh, yeah, you're gonna see Zula in in other Aliens things that are not my own comics oh, okay. which is 
Bowl, which is exciting. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Not a not a movie. Yeah. Yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I will I will temper it by saying that, but uh other <laughs> for sure. So I'm doing that. I'm doing my my sword daughter book, Dark Horse. Yeah. Um with Mac Chatter. Yeah, so let's and talk about I'm, that. That's like a sure. um uh, like an Asian cinema style. It's like a mashup. Like I, yeah. you know, the, again, to go back to North, North, <laughs> I feel like yeah. all roads, <laughs> all, that really like launched a lot of threads of my career Yeah, is I'm, I'm always every, every time I meet an artist, I start talking with like a new artist. They're like, this is sound, sounds like I'm bragging and I, I don't mean to really, but they say, I always wished I could have drawn some, some North Northlanders. Can you write me another Viking story? (laughs) (laughs) It's not always like, I mean, that's flattering. There's only so many Viking things I can write, you know, before people are like, all right, Brian, we get it, you know? (laughs) Um, So, but it's Max, like, I really want to do a Viking thing. And I'm like, all right, I'm like, how can I, you know, what's the angle I can approach this at, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we just talked about a lot of other things we were into, you know, uh, the other genres. And one of the things we landed on was samurai movies, yeah. like not, not necessarily the actual history of the samurai, right. but like, uh, like a criterion movie, like all mm-hmm. those like fists of blood and everything. Yep. So we're like, let's figure out how we can make a make a hybrid of this like what's the part from one that goes with the part from like another so that when they meet they're they're greater than the sum of their parts you know mm. like what's the magic mix mm. and uh you know like this is something like mac had a lot of story story input on this you know it's a very art driven thing and it's like a father-daughter revenge tale that sort of it's a little bit like lone, lone Wolf and Cub in the sense that it's a parent and a younger per- per- person. But in mine, like the, like the daughter is older, a, le- a little bit, you know, the father is, is less less uh, accomplished, you know. But it's like a, one of those like sort of epic road quest revenge tales that you would have seen in one of those like kind of semi-schlocky samurai movies. Yeah, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any, anything else coming up that you can talk about? I'm writing. I've been doing a lot of TV writing. Oh, okay. Um, I've written. This is this is an interesting thing to talk talk about because yeah. it's um, could not be more different from writing comics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The big difference, like if you write a comic, ninety nine percent of the time it'll it'll get get made and appear on the shelves. Like yeah. now, if I pitch a pitch a comic. Yeah, it's like a hundred percent sure it'll be on the shelf. You know, mm-hmm. it may not last a long time, but it'll be out there, right? Right, right. And what I've determined three pilots later is that I can spend years and years and years killing myself writing these things, and no one will ever see them, right? Because most yeah. pilot pilots never get uh, made. You know, yeah, it's true. Yeah, which is an interesting ego check. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed that. You know. Mm-hmm. I've also enjoyed the process of instead of rushing a comic script out the door and believe me, every single comic book writer <laughs> rushes their scripts out the door because we have this weird, we have this built in deadline that mm-hmm. cannot change. Right. We're like a monthly based industry, you know, previews yeah. and everything. Um, and, but I'm spending a year on a pilot and you, can refine the hell out of that thing right you have really smart people giving you feedback you just have time you have time to think think about it you have time to come up with like better ideas or better ways to write this certain certain scene and one one of my pilots went through like 27 drafts right and and i'll be honest with you and say that that's pretty annoying once you're up to 27 you're ready to be done yeah i can imagine (laughs) But it's so much better. But draft 20, 27 is like light, light years better than draft four, you know, mm-hmm. way, way better, you know? Yeah. So it, it's a very, it's like all different creative muscles. Like I said, it's a good ego check. Makes me slow down, makes me think, and makes me learn a lot, you mm-hmm. know? So yeah. even though it's frustrating that, you know, 
I wrote a pilot that I thought Robert Rod or Rodriguez was was going to produce, but he's oh, but wow. he's not, and wow. that sucks. Yeah, I wrote a Brinsland yeah. pilot that AMC passed on. That oh. sucks. Now I'm writing another one that I'm not going to say because I don't know what's going to happen with it yet. Yeah. But um, that may not work just because, like I said, most things don't. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving it a shot. You know, I'm just like sort of experimenting. And, you know, I've done comics for like 20 plus years. So it's no reason to not try something else. So uh, how does the... I'm also writing writing a novel, too. Oh, wow. Not not much I can say say about that, but it's another thing I'm trying out. Okay. Is that that hard for you to um, to transition from the... Well, I, this, this writing the script sounds like com- something completely different, but going from a comic to a novel, um, they're all different. They're yeah. all different. Um, the funniest thing is that it took, it took me years to finally take the plunge on the, on the screen, a, a screenplay, mm-hmm. partly because I just didn't know how to do it. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, the, like the mechanics of it, like it's hard, oh. it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, really yeah. hard to like and it's hard in like a million different ways but the funny thing is now i'm but i eventually figured it out right and so now i'm trying to do it with with prose mm-hmm. and the thing i'm learning is that comic book writing and screenwriting has taught me to communicate everything really fast and really brief right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I'm writing little captions in the scripts, right? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. not pro. And so when when I sat I sat down, I was like, okay, here's I have an opening scene for my novel in my head, yeah. And I type it out, and it's like half a page long. And I'm like, yeah. well, well, this is isn't working. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have to completely rethink everything. Right. Like right. I have to come at this from like the most freshest of ang- angles. I have to forget yeah. everything I knew, you know? Yeah. And I have to figure, and so I'm like, how does somebody write? I have to like, I'm reading all these books, you know, reading like books by Greg, Greg Ruck and Warren Ellis, who are comic book writers, you right. know, and seeing if there's any like wisdoms I can glean from their prose. Um, yeah. But it's a, it's a learning process. And I'm in the middle of that, that now. That was interesting watching uh, Charles soul go through the same thing via Twitter and him talk about it. Over the, oh, well, yeah. the years, he was writing his book as well, and just him realizing exactly what you're saying, like this yeah. is a completely different uh, medium. Yeah. Right. It's a, there's a lot of like, I mean, you you write one thing for for 20 years, and your body learns it, right? Yeah. Right. In way way more than you than you're even aware of, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of un, unlearning that has to happen. So yeah. for the screenplays, is it like, do you get direction from is someone like, hey, there's a there's a call for these screenplays, you got a year, or is it just you take the time like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna develop these, and, or and or a pilot, I mean, and yeah. and give that to someone. It's it's um, well, the, I mean, there's obviously many many ways it could go down. The way mm-hmm. it's gone down with me twice, and I mean, the first time was a bit of a weird case but yeah. the other times they're my own books right so uh, yeah. someone will usually reach out to me or to my agent mm-hmm. and be like i'm interested in let's say briggs land for yeah. t- a tv series oh, okay and my agent's like well brian wood would very much like to write that you know, yeah which usually stops the conversation there because right? yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah. want us involved you know right. they want to have they have their own plan right right yeah. But, you know, we like negotiate it. And so I've usually worked either with another writer who's like very established, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and they're like sort of overseeing me, you know, so because I'm learning yeah, or some very hands on producers. And I'm the only writer, but they're like heavily helping me with like notes and looking at all my outlines and mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And then the, so there's. But there's always two levels of, of producers. There's those more like immediate hands-on types. Yep. And then usually the people who are paying for the pilot, paying me to write it, mm-hmm. um, are like a level above. So this is like two two tiers of approvals I have to oh, wow. clear and meet, which yeah. is why it take, takes a while. Um, yeah. You know, there's like lots of jokes about like, oh, people refer to these people as like suits and they're idiots and they don't know what they're talking about. And I'm sure yeah, those people yeah. exist. I thankfully yep. have not really 
met any of those types yet. Everybody I've met has have been cool and smart and genuinely, uh, you know, trying to help and not just trying to, you know, listen to the sound of their own voice. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so it's like, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, I think I'll always do comics because mm-hmm. it's like comics are, I mean, there's the reason why so, so many of us stay in comics is that for the fact that we can, like everything we do, we'll see a print. Right. Yeah. Right. And we're generally our own bosses, you know, yeah. we have editors, but you know, it's like, they're not real editors <laughs> like the editors <laughs> I'm working with yeah. on this, on screen screenplay. Like they're there to like help us get it, get it done, mm-hmm. not to decide if it's going to happen or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, comics are just like fun and easy and there's so much freedom in them. I mean, at the end of the day, you, I mean, everybody feels very, uh, you're, you're writing with, and you like these ideas that you've created. You're very, genuine with your writing and stuff you want to see the project be made at the end of the day too for sure i mean there's yeah. part of that right right uh, and also there's something uh un- you unique about partnering with an artist you know um yeah. because what i bring to it is only half of the com- comic you know for sure so yeah. it's like two it's a bunch of people coming coming together and creating some, some, something that would never have existed Mm-hmm. If those specific people did not come together, you know, yeah, as opposed to me all off on my lonesome writing a novel, it's it's just a one man show, but this yeah. is like a group, yeah. group group effort, and that's like, I'm not saying that's good or bad or better than this or not as good as this, but it's a unique thing, you know, that mm-hmm. that only exists in comics. Well, it's like what dragged you to Vertigo almost, because I mean, if you look at um, back when Preacher was being made or something compared to a Batman comic. When you look at the, the covers on a shelf, like some of those vertigo covers at the time were just jumping out at people with the art. And then the stories were something they wanted to. Right. Than the norm. Um, for sure. Awesome. Well, Hey man, thanks for being on the show. If anybody wants to, to follow you or keep up with what you're doing, where can they find you? Um, I have a newsletter. If you go to brianwood.com, you can sign okay. up for it. Um, it's on. It's been on pause, but I'm going to start it up again really soon. Okay, cool. I am on Twitter, although I really wish I wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think we all do. I feel like I kind of have to be. You know, yeah. I'm like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to like yeah. leave it. You know, yeah. I built up a lot, but I'm Brian. I'm Brian Wood on Twitter. Um, okay, but it's not particularly active. So I would recommend if you had to choose to to sign up for the, the emails. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I want to start getting those those going in the next month again. Okay, cool. cool. Well, thanks so much for being on. We really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us. No, thank, thank you. you. It, was, it was a lot of fun. And we're back. Ah, uh, yes. What a great interview. Um, so please go check out Brian Wood at brianwood.com. And all his amazing work is uh, you search him on Comixology, Amazon. Uh, he has it available on his website, uh, Previews Magazine with the alien stuff and sword daughter that he's putting out. So check him out. Really good stuff. Yeah. Check out Brian Wood. He's one of the more underrated guys in the industry today. Yeah, for sure. Um, and with that, we're going to get on to the comic book news. Woo-hoo! Chris has all this space to work with, with like his new camera angle here. So we got like Kevin Smith with the Kevin Smith cheesing on the right. And then, uh, he's got all this, you know, he could probably start standing up and doing the podcast, moving around if he wants. Probably yeah. dancing. All right. So David F. Walker is uh, starting his own comic company called sold comics. Hey man, first off create your own comic book company. I wish I had a t-shirt that said that because I support this a hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's great. There should be more. Yeah. Anyone um, that doesn't know David F. Walker, he's the guy that's co-writing Naomi right now at DC. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, anywhere that wants to publish more create their own comics, uh, good on you. And then we'll have him on the show. Oh, God, please, yes. Uh, I would talk to David F. Walker, especially down the line when Naomi is uh, kicking. Yeah, we should uh, um, get get with our people over at DC. We don't have people at DC. That would be awesome. I mean, if he wants to promote it, though, if he wants to promote this, this comic book line, you know. Let me just text Jim Lee real quick. Yeah, can you call him Jim Lee? Um, yeah, so 
Marvel reviews, you know, we have free comic book day coming up in a couple months here. Uh, it's already, but it's already a couple months. We're going to have a table. Super excited. Again, yeah. we have a table two years in a row. So you know what that means? That we're officially established presence at free comic book day. Yeah. And soon to announce, I know who else is popping up and, uh, I don't think it's, yeah, it's official, but it's not official yet. So yeah, we, uh, we will all be super excited. We might not, we may or may not have a special guest joining us. Um, yeah, so Marvel revealed their free comic book day issue of Spider Man slash Venom crossover, and and that's not that's not just it. Donnie it's Cates, better, folks. Donnie Cates and Tom Taylor. Can wow. you imagine a more Chris duo in comics today? We just call this the Chris Run Special for free yeah. comic book day. So yeah, everyone knows my man crush with Donny Cates, the beautiful, beautiful Donny Cates, yep. and uh, how much I really enjoy Tom Taylor's work as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Was super sad to see Injustice Two uh, finally come to an end, but the fact that he's working on, uh, I think it's Friendly Neighborhood Spider Man, mm-hmm. and with Donny working on Venom, and those two coming together to do this crossover, it's 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 going to be awesome. I can't wait for it. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, so that's, it, what, that's it, the first of the free comic book day stuff that we're getting from yeah. week two. So yep. I can't wait to see what DC has. DC better have something because they're like, oh shit, oh wow, they that's like that's like DC saying, okay, here we go, uh, um, Tom King, you're writing the free comic book day issue. <laughs> so they either need to pull out the Tom King or the the Brian Michael Bendis, uh, yeah, to make yeah. it official. But yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, so uh, with that, Donnie Cates wants to reboot the Ultimate Universe line, and Chris's wallet just got a lot thinner. Yes. yes. So, so someone on Twitter brought this up. Yeah. And uh, Donnie just responded like, yes, I'm all about this. Let's do this. So this probably will never happen, but I would be so down. I love the Ultimate Universe. It was such a cool... A uh, little like side universe, especially when it first started. Uh, you know, getting these characters with no background and mo- no backstory, just knowing like, hey, here's a different version of Captain America, or here's a different version of the X Men, um, and allowing them to grow in different ways. You know, the X Men being created by the government as super soldiers, and um, all these different things that happened, and mm-hmm. I am so for it. Uh, I want the yeah. ultimates back. That's but. how. That's how you get a whole. That, that's how Donny Cates gets his own Marvel. <laughs> is if he just gets that universe, he I, can have any character he wants. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're not that far away. Like, especially if Jason Aaron was just like, "Yeah, let's do this." Marvel would be like, "Oh, well, I guess we're bringing back the Ultimates because <laughs> they're back." We need to keep Jason Aaron happy. And, and, and I mean, look at the people that writing the Ultimates back today. Like, uh, Mark Miller had his run, and. It was amazing. I mean, I even I, that was a Marvel comic that I even read. So there you go. Miller, Bendis. Bendis. I mean, there, yeah, there's some greats that came out of that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, with that, let's talk about what we read this week. Um, probably uh, one that we both read, I'm assuming, uh, Justice League 17. So with uh, my sickness, I have not read a whole ton, but uh, feel free to talk about whatever you got. Yeah, so Justice League 17, uh, man, I <laughs> if you were to ask me like what this issue would be, I, I didn't know it was going to be like a, a bromance story between Martian Manhunter and Lex Luthor on a planet with giant T-Rexes trying to eat them. Uh, it was interesting. So uh, there, the whole issue is a a conversation between Martian Manhunter and Lex Luthor on Mars. Um, Martian Manhunter tells him the story of how he, he had a childhood best friend that was also had these gifted abilities. Um, they would come to this planet to, I don't know, rid of the, rid themselves of these like thoughts that were like overbearing them. <clears throat> Cause apparently these giant T-Rex monsters feed on like your thoughts and bad, your bad thoughts or something. I don't know. It's, it's Scott Snyder. But anyways, there's a lot of comic book science going on. So the big reveal is the childhood friend was Lex Luthor as a kid. He just doesn't remember it because he had his memory wiped. Um, and the, the the whole issue ends with, like, Martian Manhunter goes back to Hall of Justice. Uh, Lex Luthor goes back to the Legion of Doom. 
And they they both were trying to, like, Lex Luthor was supposed to kidnap Martian Manhunter to do testing. Uh, they were supposed to bring Lex back to try to convince him to help them out with uh, recreating the source wall and fixing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and neither of them do anything. The issue kind of ends with, like, oh, I hope we convinced him. And uh, Lex Luthor was like, yeah, he was kind of whatever. He wasn't worth our time. But it, it looks like there's some glimmer or spark of hope for Lex Luthor that he might turn around and do the right thing because what he's trying to do right now is be the controller of the creation and all that stuff. So this sounds very much like a stopgap issue. Yeah. Yep. Um, don't really know what's going on with this story. It started off pretty strong, and now we've kind of just been lingering. I think, isn't next month the Fifth Dimension storyline? Mm-hmm. So I think we're just trying to get to there. At this yeah. Point. Um, yeah. And the uh, the Batman issue this week, Batman sixty three, yes, is uh, was written by Nate uh, Williamson, or uh, yeah, yeah, it's part of the crossover. Yep, yep. Um, and there's like a, it's like a Batman, or actually, this one's written by King, but it's the next one takes place. Um, the next one takes place. On Flash, there's a crossover with Flash, but yeah. So uh, basically, it, it it's part of the Heroes of Crisis. Um, it's part of that continuity, and they talk about like Batman and Flash investigating that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in between investigating all investigating all that, uh, Gotham Girl has come back and is like attacking places throughout the city, and that's cool to see her come back. And then she's trying to resurrect her brother, which almost looks like he has the the Venom formula pumping through his veins. Hmm. So Gotham man, uh, who's already super powered enough to begin with is going to have like the venom juice to keep him alive, which would be pretty cool to see. I think, um, what else did I have? Uh, Oh yeah, it was Batman 64. Sorry, not 63. And I think that was it. That was it. No. Oh, Green Lantern 4. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very heavy book. Lots of different space creatures. Grant Morrison's Green Lantern. Um, yeah, so we get we get this interesting conversation in that issue with uh, this stranger who's looking for looking to contact the Dark Stars. Um, and the they're both... It's basically Hal Jordan in costume and the leader of the Dark Star is in a costume, and they're both conversing with each other about how it's it's a really Grant Morrison story. Like I couldn't even begin to start talking. Like there's these two, um, ah, man. There's like the Green Lanterns try to create these this artificial sun because like these Sun Eaters show up, and in doing so, I think they actually killed one of the Sun Eaters, and now Hal Jordan is was like put under arrest for because the guardians think that like you should like even though you stopped a, a, a big crisis event from happening like those those things are still living beings I guess um, but at the end of the issue Hal Jordan reveals like he's talking about this as a story with this uh, masked assailant and it ends up being um, the leader that he was looking for and the the leader that the dark stars is like is like uh, or he, or Hal Jordan wants to join the Dark Stars is basically what's going to happen. We don't know why. Um, Countess Bezel- Bezelbeth is her name. And uh, he wants to join and he gives up his ring at the, the Black Stars to the leader of the Black Star. He's like, I want to join you guys and I'll even throw in my ring to join you guys. So he needs something from them. Um, and I don't know why. So my 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 thought is they're the black stars, not the dark stars. Sorry, everybody. Um, but the my thought is like if he gives up his ring to become a, a black star, maybe he could use their power to kind of break the rules of the Green Lantern. So maybe he needs to kill someone or do something that's not that would be frowned upon by the Guardians. Um, it's a pretty epic story in the fact that like. <clears throat> 
Uh, you get a lot of different Green Lanterns. They have that weird Green Lantern with a volcano for a head who's, like, hard to understand. Because, <laughs> like, you have to read his dialogue in between his head exploding, like, rupturing. Um, yeah, so it's like the Hal Jordan's talking with this mass assailant for part, most of the issue about the Black Stars while, they, <clears throat> while they're retelling the story of uh, why he got in trouble with the Guardians. So it's a pretty good issue. Um, I love I love the book just solely because of all the all the alien races. It's I'm not reading the book because of the plot right now. It's just because of like all these different characters you're getting to see within the stories, and I think that's kind of what it is. It's almost like an anthology. It seems like um, Wrong Earth number six. This is my favorite book out right now, and it actually came to a stop. It's it's taking a break till it said they will be back in 2020. So Tom Pear. The guy we had on the show, um, six issues. This is the the last issue, and I can't wait to see what they do with the book because uh, basically at the end of it, we get another Earth is introduced. So they have um, Earth Alpha and Earth Beta or Earth Omega, and then um, they the villain who got transported through the the mirror as well to the wrong Earth um, goes through like a cracked version of the mirror. And then he, we find out he is put into the future on earth Zeta. And he becomes like this tech mogul. That's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like really wealthy and powerful and smart. And he's basically the Lex Luthor on a third earth. So we're hopefully we get some stories with that. Um, but it's, it's really pretty crazy because we start seeing the, the, you know, the dark Knight version of the character Dragonfly man, um, we see him starting to conform to like the '60s Batman Earth, and then we see we also see the '60s Batman version conforming to like the Dark Knight Earth. So I think they're kind of like settling into their their Earths almost, and then they start showing like um, the way they're solving issues. There seems to be some crossover there with like it's both universes are kind of like mimicking what they're doing. It's really cool, um, but as you know, like the uh, the sixties Batman and the dark Knight both have their different approaches to solving crime, but the, like they both end up telling lies in between there, which isn't really, you know, it wouldn't be true to Dragonfly or Batman at all, but yeah, it's, it's really cool, man. It, I can't, I can't try to sell this book to people enough because it's so good. I'm waiting for that trade. I really want to read it. Yeah. All in one sitting. Yeah. And then uh, this week I also read, uh, Candy Mountain, Hobo Candy Mountain. Oh, Rock Candy Mountain. Rock Candy Mountain. Yeah, yeah. I read Volume One and Two. Uh, those books um, were amazing, and I, I mean the the story is in those two volumes, and I read them in like a couple days. They were quick reads, but yeah, it's a really great story of um, <laughs> a train riding hobo and. Um, he makes a deal with the devil to try to get back to his family from war. And he's looking for this secret candy mountain. And it's just, it's awesome. It's a really great story. It's a, it's a great adventure story. It's a great, uh, like a Asian cinema telling like Kung Fu fighting. It's awesome. It's and making deals with the devil all mixed up into a book. It's great. Um, I also read a couple issues of Alien Defiance by our uh, great guest Brian Wood, and that's a um, it's just a a future story from the Alien universe, which isn't something I would normally read, but I really enjoyed it. Um, if you're yeah. a fan of the Alien uh, books at all, or even the I mean the movies and the books that have come out, this is this is great. It's very cinematic, and the the art and the the storytelling, <clears throat> it's um very epic and space-like and I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's, those are the comics I read this week. Quite a few. And you were uh, busy this week. Yeah. And catch up, catching up on shows. So I, yeah, I've been, I've been away from the gym for the last couple of weeks, um, for an, because of an injury. So I, uh, I've had a lot of time to catch up on things <laughs> when I'm just laying on the couch, eating junk food. So my day to day life, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, I got uh, Walking Dead 188. Um, so we finally get some like zombie action in this issue. Uh, That's always good. 
the short end of it is that there's a horde heading towards um, a couple of our people that are trying to work on the trains to get these two communities to uh, have some sort of easy um, route to trade with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're still dealing with the whatever they call it, the the community down up north. Uh, Conan the Barbarian number three. So we get kind of a, a past story about Conan and his feelings on religion, or at least his uh, his experiences with religion and how that comes into play into today's story. It was a really cool uh, one off story that ended in a way that. Uh, really meshed with the overall arc that uh, Jason Aaron's going with here. I'm really enjoying what he's doing with this. And Cool. Um, Captain America number seven. This was last week's issue, actually. But uh, So Thunderbolt Ross has been killed, and nobody knows who did it, but everybody suspects that it's Steve Rogers because of uh, uh, disagreements that they've had and uh, very open fighting that they've had. Uh, recently in the book and this whole issue is basically steve kind of coming to grips with the fact that even though he is captain america and he is meant to be the vision of what america is uh he's having trouble with the fact that he's always at odds with the government Mm -hmm. they never agree yeah and and it goes into a lot of uh talk about his past as nomad and as the captain and this and that at the end of it i disagree with what tamahasi coates uh, what his conclusion is i i don't know if he's gonna stick with this conclusion or if this is gonna be kind of a crisis for steve mm-hmm. but my thoughts always were that with cap uh, fighting against the government is kind of the whole point of captain america right and that the the american spirit is to fight <laughs> uh the government or the man if you will Mm -hmm. and that's part of what captain america is so i i hope that's not the route he's going down that he's just going to make captain america subservient to whatever the government says but we'll see um it's still a really good book and it's uh it's at the point where it's asking really great questions i think tamahasi coates is starting to get a hang on what comic book writing really is all about because um, I have heard about all of his uh, problems in the past. Mm-hmm. And then also last week I read Wired, which was a Dark Horse book by, um, I think it was Kurt Cease, who I'm trying to get on the show. And uh, that's a, it's a crime noir book where this, the lead character, he can't die, but he wants to die. <laughs> so when you first meet him, he's jumping off a bridge into oncoming traffic. And uh, you end up finding out that he was uh, part of some super soldier project. So it's got a a Captain America tie. Okay. Um, so right up your alley. Yeah. So it really <laughs> hit every note for me where I thought this was just a cool crime noir book that had a Sean Phillipsy style art. But it's a crime noir book with a Sean Phillipsy style art that has some ties to a Captain America-esque storyline. So I really, really enjoyed that issue, if you can tell. Yeah. Awesome. Excuse me. <coughs> I apologize, everybody. I'm super sick right now, but the show must go on. Show uh, and on. Uh, and then my last book was Chips or Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil. Um, so we just got off a four issue mini series, or I'm sorry, five issue mini series, where Daredevil had been hit by a train or a bus, I think it was, and was uh, recovering. And that whole mini series was really cool. It was all about him basically coming to terms with the fact that he's not he's not a superhero he's you know he's kind of he's a man mm-hmm. who has superish abilities mm-hmm. and this issue picks up with him right after uh, his rehab and him being kind of back to normal mm-hmm. and just getting back to being daredevil and how he's he has a moment here where he almost gets killed by a couple of thugs and he has a moment afterwards where he gets up and he's just like you know i fought ultron i fought galactus i fought thanos and I almost died because of two thugs and kind of realizing like he's not back to hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and there's also like kind of a background there of him taking a lot of pain pills and drinking a lot. Oh, so, yeah. uh, it's a really great book. And, uh, I think it was Marcos Chichetto is the artist and, uh, his daredevil is fantastic. He's, he was built to draw daredevil. 
Yeah. Cool. And then uh, my last was a trade. I read uh, Tom King's The War of Joke and Riddles. Nice. Um, in my opinion, the least of the four volumes I've read so far of the Batman, I kind of didn't enjoy it as much as the other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a little like a slow part kind of. Yeah, I, I see what he's going for, and I see wh- like where it ends up with him almost killing uh, Riddler. Uh, spoilers. And uh, what he's trying to tell Catwoman through that story, but it it just as a four, what was it, six, seven issues? Yeah. Uh, kind yeah. of dragged on for too long and not a whole lot happened. So, kind of a downer in the whole Tom King uh, story arc so far, but that's you know, they can't all be amazing. I right. Guess. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be some lows. So, Mike, uh, that's all I have. Uh, if people want to find you on the internet, what would be the best way for them to find you? Fortress Ricker on the Twitter. Where can they find you, Chris? Oh, why you can find me at Fortress Chris on Twitter. Or you can find the show at FCN underscore official. And, of course, FortressComicNews.com, where everything we do is posted right there on that handy-dandy website. So, everybody, please, you know, thumbs up on the YouTube video, subscribe to the channel, uh, reviews on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, all that stuff. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being you. Thanks, everyone.